Well, we're, um, we finished our discussion on the, um, the uh, electronics in, in electrochemistry. Of course, that's a very limited discussion, a very brief discussion of what's happening, but it's hopefully it'll give you some idea what's going on when you actually push the button and get your duck on the CV and, and uh, can tell, try to figure out what's going wrong if something go, does go wrong. Um, what I'd like to do is, since we have a little bit more time, let's see if we can do a little bit more in the area of organic electrochemistry. So let's go back to our notes. And I'm going to skip to uh, the Colby reaction because it's a very uh, well known and, and uh, studied reaction that really is still causing some difficulties in actually analyzing what's happening. And it points out some of the difficulties that you can get into when you do reactions and uh, don't really have a, a, a very nice control of the reaction conditions. Uh, it was developed in 1843 uh, by Colby who showed that if you oxidized uh, carboxylic acids on a platinum anode, either in some sort of or in some organic solution or methanol, you get some interesting results. And basically, this was not with a potentiostat or any sort of fancy device. They just used a battery, hooked the electrodes up, cranked the voltage up, and just let it rip, basically. And by letting it go under uncontrolled potential conditions and so on, you got an oxidation. Obviously, uh, you should make a uh, radical anion. That radical anion is considered a eliminate the carbon dioxide, which they can observe the carbon dioxide coming off. And what happens is then you get a dimerization in about 50 to 90 percent yield. And that's incredible because you don't really expect that radical to only dimerize with itself. You'd expect it to react with the solvent and so on. So you expect a lot of side reaction. In fact, the reaction is give you very good uh, dimerization. Um, and like I said, it's very easy to do that. You just put your platinum electrodes in solution, just crank it up and, and let it go. Uh, the thing is, what happens is that, in fact, the solution conditions are such is that you really don't expect the reaction to proceed at all. In fact, if you look at the normal conditions, you get water um, oxidation at this point. And the Colby reaction doesn't really occur until you get out past that potential. So you're actually doing the reaction beyond the solvent limit. And what's now thought to happen is that you're getting absorbed film of this material as you're doing the reaction. Rather than doing the reaction only in solution, you actually have an absorbed film of this intermediate material, and that causes the solution conditions to be different where the reaction is actually occurring than it is outside. Uh, that point, and that's why you're getting good yields because your radicals are all in this absorbed film. Um, and you can get, you know, with, uh, with symmetrical or the same carboxylic acid, you get reactions like so. Pretty interesting ones that you probably couldn't do otherwise. And uh, as I said, you can also have mixed carboxylic acids and get uh, cross Colby reactions where you get uh, asymmetric dimers. Not really dimers, but coupling of asymmetric species. All right, well, the other thing I want to talk about is industrial uh, electrochemistry. In industrial electrochemistry, the point is to maximize profit while minimizing the cost of the um, starting materials and, and electricity and so on. So they have a different goal. And so they're going to do whatever they can take to improve the efficiency by whatever route. And of course, their goal is to make money and not to lose money. So they're going to, if it doesn't work by electrochemistry, they're not going to be using it. Now, electricity is a pretty cheap reagent, but it's not the cheapest. Many uh, sources of energy are available as the coal or natural gas that have a lot of stored energy in it essentially uh, stored solar energy from uh, plant materials. And those are often easier to use, uh, cheaper to use than electricity. But as I said, electricity can be used under conditions where some reagents are not available. So aluminum, 
smelting does not, there's no reducing agent that's strong enough to really reduce aluminum oxide to aluminum metal that you can efficiently and easily mine from the ground. So you have to use electricity and that's the cheapest source of, of, of reducing agent. So the energy consumption in this sort of thing is, a, is perhaps sometimes a minor consideration for some industrial processes, but in most industrial electrochemistry processes it's not so minor, particularly aluminum uh, production. Your energy consumption per mole will be the number of electrons per uh, conversion, the Faraday, the uh, potential difference, and the efficiency, current efficiency that we're how efficient the reaction is. In the Colby reaction, your efficiency was 50 to 90 percent. So that would be what you'd put in there. That's how much current you put in and that's how much product you get out. Um, so one kilowatt hour is um, about 3,600 kilojoules, which is quite a lot of energy. And so per metric ton, the energy consumption would be about 0.278 NFE phi M, where M is the molecular weight in grams per mole. So we're mixing uh, uh, SI and non-SI units dramatically here. So, but you can you can calculate what the, your how much energy you're going to be using to make a ton of material. So you want to do a couple things. You want to have low, you might, you might have low current efficiency and that may be due to the fact that you've got IR drop in the system and that's using up your electrons to heat the system up rather than to do electrical conversions. You have over potential, again that over potential is not doing you any good, it's just adding to the heat of the system. Um, and the problem with the IR drop is that the more current that you have through it, the more possibility you have IR drop and so the uh, this, as you scale up, your IR drop may in fact increase rather than decrease, which is not what you want. Over potential often will increase, especially if you try to run the reaction at higher rates to minimize the time scale of the experiment. The faster you try to do it, the more the over potential will increase. So you have to very carefully balance the over potential requirements and time scale of the system, the amount of energy, and, uh, and so on. So sometimes this is better, sometimes it's worse, but usually you rely on economies of scale. So when you do aluminum production, you don't just do a little, you do a huge thing and it's where you can easily engineer the system so that you minimize over potentials and you minimize the current inefficiencies. Let's take a look at a couple of different uh, electrolytic process. One is electroplating. Uh, for example, chromium-6 plating on uh, metal is a very important industrial process. Brass plating, gold plating, silver plating, uh, all these are available. Now sometimes plating is done in what they call electroless process where you put it in a system that has a thermodynamic driving force just in the system conditions to let the reaction proceed. So nickel can be electrolessly plated. You just put it in a system that the nickel will spontaneously be reduced under those solution conditions, but they're reduced on the surface and so you plate on the surface. But many things are not spontaneous. You have to supply electricity uh, to the system. The problem with electroplating is a lot of things. Uh, it's kind of an, still uh, considered to be kind of a craft science because there's lots of things you can adjust. For example, um, you have to plate usually all the parts of the material, not just the surface. So if you have a, a crevice, on the surface, you want that crevice to be perhaps uniformly plated. And if it's uniformly plated, that means that we have to make sure the over potential or the IR drop is no more here than it is out here, and that can be very difficult. So usually what you have to do is run the reaction at less than the diffusion control rate so that you don't, or the mass transport control rate, so you don't worry about things getting in and out of that crevice and, and reacting. So that's one of the limitations of, of that. The other thing is that you may have uh, very sharp points on your plated material and those sharp points build up electric field and they can cause local production of hydrogen gas. 
because of the way you're doing the reaction. So those hydrogen bubbles then will cause pits and voids in your plating, which is not what you want. So there's all kinds of things you have to adjust to get plating to work right. Um, usually you have to add complexing agents to make sure that your metal is in the proper, uh, is soluble enough or is in the proper concentration. You usually have to add wetting agents so that if you do make hydrogen gas, which you almost always will, they will not stick to the surface, but they will be released and bubble off. And if they're not releasing, they're gonna sit there and cause the plating to be ununiform. Un um, usually what they have is what they call levelers, and levelers are things that allow you to plate recessed areas with good efficiency. Essentially what they are, inhibitors. They make the plating occur slower than you would normally uh, plate. And because sometimes you don't want the plating to occur as fast as it possibly can, you want it to occur uniformly, and so you want all the parts to plate at the same speed, and so you want to slow down these exposed areas and speed up these uh, recessed areas. Uh, and brighteners are used to make the surface perhaps smoother than it otherwise would be. So there's a kind of a witch's brew in every, so every electroplating system has got a, its own sort of proprietary mix usually of, of plating agents, of complexing agents and so on. Now usually you get pretty good current efficiency for metal reduction because you're not, usually you're not operating at uh, high over potentials, you're operating low on the, on the wave, so the diffusion control is not a problem. And you're doing metal reductions, which usually have good kinetics. Uh, but there is one important industrial one, that's chromium reduction, which is really poor. Um, you have chromium in the form of the chrom chromium-6, and that's the only chromium ion that can actually be reduced to produce the chromium metal, and it's a six electron process. And some of that in the process gets converted to chromium-3, which is non-reducible and a hazardous waste. And so you have lots of electrons and you make a lot of hazardous waste besides. So in your industrial electrochemistry, that N is equal to six, so that's six times more energy than you'd like to have to add. It'd be nice if you could plate chromium-3, that would immediately have the amount of electricity that you'd need, but, um, and people would kill for that, literally kill for that, I think, uh, but um, it's not happening. So that's one of the problems. People are trying to all of the time figure out better ways to do chromium plating and re removing the requirement for chromium-6. Okay, another important industrial process is anodiza anodization. anodization. Um, usually you're anodizing things like aluminum, but some things like copper, titanium, steel are also anodized. Anodization refers to the fact that you're oxidizing the surface in some way, as you might expect. Uh, for example, you would take aluminum metal, which already has a oxide layer on it as normally it would, but you can reduce it, oxidize it, form aluminum oxide. And again, that's a, that's a, a lot of electrons, but again, you're just doing the surface, so it's not actually, you don't have to convert a lot of material, so it's not a very energy intensive process. Um, what you usually add in there for the ionization process are things like sulfuric acid, also chromic acid. This is a big problem with aluminum oxide anodization is it uses uh, chromic acid, which is, helps to improve corrosion resistance, and that's a big problem. Um, all these places that did anodization and uh, uh, corrosion resistance, like aluminum air, planes and so on had chromium mass, chromium contamination, and so that's uh, a push to re remove the requirements for chromic acid in this process. Oxalic acid is also used. And you add, I, you add dyes in there to make the color difference. You add things that played in very thin transparent films to make interference patterns. So you can make blue and green and so on. So all these things are added and they get incorporated, trapped into this aluminum oxide, which is really just a clear uh, material. It's only, it looks white when it's in a bulk form because it's usually in, a, in lots of little pieces, just like snow is white. 
Uh, so let's talk about um, some bulk electrolysis processes now. Uh, the biggest use of electricity for uh, industrial purposes is aluminum production. And all of people use the hall hero process, um, developed uh, pretty much simultaneously by Hall, who was uh, pretty much, um, I think, 20 or 19 at the time when he developed this, sometime, somewhere around there, very young person. Hero, a French guy, developed it essentially the same process at the same time. Uh, like I said, you can't uh, smelt aluminum like iron. If you try to do that, remember when you make iron, you take iron oxide, add in carbon. Uh, it's a little bit more complicated, this, but the overall reaction is this. And you get uh, carbon monoxide, which you can burn to produce more energy for your smelting process. Simple reduction. You can use coal from the ground to do this process. And so it's very simple. But carbon does not have enough reducing power to reduce uh, aluminum. And so you have to use um, a um, electrolytic process. Let's see if I can. The idea is you have a bath, it's a steel bath usually, with a tap. Inside the bath, you'd use the steel as a as a uh, cathode. And then on top, you would insert a series of uh, carbon anodes. That would be slowly lowered in. The carbon is destructively chewed up. And of course, initially, you'd have those very close, and you'd automatically adjust the spacing. Inside there, you'd have uh, a mixture of molten mixture of materials, it's cryolite and uh, alumina. And this is, is running at, a, at a 800 to 1,000 degrees C. The steel cathode is often lined with carbon to provide additional. Carbon is there mostly to provide uh, corrosion protection than anything else. You wouldn't otherwise need it. Um, you need about 15,000 kilowatt hours per ton, and the world uses about two to the, two times 10 to the seventh tons per year in the world, so you're using an awful lot of electricity to do the aluminum production this way. Um, on top, there's a little crust, which is nice because it keeps the heat in. The basic process is aluminum oxide reduction. The cryolite is there just to make the melt that lower temperature. You're really, you're just, you're reducing the aluminum oxide. And of course, since it's not in solution, we can easily make the oxide ion, which reacts with uh, carbon. Um, oops. Not O2 plus, as I wrote there. And you get about 0.7, so the stoichiometric is about 0.7 moles of carbon per mole of aluminum. So you do use up the carbon anode as destructive. You have to use up uh, because of that oxide ion, otherwise it has to go somewhere, and so it has to go to the carbon, and carbon is the cheapest material. The problem with aluminum, you have to make those carbon anodes, it can't be just anything, they have to be very pure because otherwise you introduce all kinds of impurities into the molten aluminum and into the melt, which would poison the system after a while. And so that's also, as part of the aluminum process, you have to make these carbon anodes, which are, uh, so every aluminum smelter has a manufacturing process for carbon anodes at the same time. The cell potential uh, to do the reaction is about minus 1.2 volts. So not too much in that particular case. It's a three electron process. IR drop, which is pretty remarkable, is about 2.5 volts. The over potential for the reaction is not too bad, 0.5 volts, which is actually pretty good. So you need about minus 4 volts. And of course, any little increase, decrease in the amount of voltage that you can squeak out of the thing is going to translate into millions of dollars a year in operating this thing. So they're very careful about how they're operating these cells. Um, and you can see why people are so interested in recycling. Electricity. If you calculate that, you can see well, how much energy is used. 
Uh, recycling requires none of those electrons to do the reaction, just the heat and so on. So again, much more energy efficient. A couple of things I've written there, and I can, I'll just read them because we're running out of time. Um, you can get sodium for some uh, sodium chloride, calcium chloride, eutectic melt at about 600 degrees, and that's the way they get pretty much all of these uh, alkali metals for various uses. Um, you also get chlorine at the at an anode, which you can you can use. Although chlorine gas is not particularly valuable, the st sodium floats to the top, so you skim it off the top rather than the bottom. Um, <coughs> calcium is also made the same way, except it sinks to the bottom. Um, and you can react the, in that in that case, calcium can be used uh, to generate sodium, so that's another way to make sodium metal. And that's actually probably a more efficient way. Uh, also, various metals are purified electrolytically, which is something you'll see. Copper is a very important metal that's produced purified electrolytically, and you'll often see that electrolytic copper, and almost every bit of copper that you use is electrolytically purified. There's just too much junk in it otherwise the way they normally make it. Also, most copper has enough precious metal impurities in it to make it worthwhile to purify it electrolytically. Uh, as they purify it, this material that is released contains these precious metals and if you, you can purify those impurities to get silver and gold and, and so on, depending on where it's coming from. The idea is you just, just uh, apply a voltage difference between two copper uh, electrodes. One copper electrode would be the impure copper, the other would be a pure copper and you have to oxidize the copper at one and reduce at the other. You do this in a copper chloride um, electrolyte and um, the impurities do not get deposited because there's not enough potential. Remember, you don't need a lot of potential difference between those two electrodes. You just need enough to drive the over potential for the copper oxidation and the copper reduction. So just a few tens of volts probably is enough to do the reaction plus whatever over potential that you need. All the impurities don't have the right potential difference to do the reduction, so they just drop out to the bottom. And they get what they call an anode slime, uh, which contains your important uh, metals. Um, chlorine is produced from brine and produces then sodium hydroxide as an alkali, which is important. Bromine is produced uh, by using chlorine gas to oxidize the uh, seawater brine. Uh, fluorine all comes from electrolysis. You can't make it any other way, really. And so they use uh, hydrogen fluoride, which they get by reacting uh, fluorine-containing minerals with uh, phosphoric acid. And then they reduce that or oxidize it to get fluorine gas. And that's in a, um, in a hydrous, uh, hydrogen fluoride and potassium fluoride mixture. So they melt that do the reaction, and very carefully extract the fluorine gas. <laughs> As you can imagine, that's not something you, you want to mess with otherwise. All these uh, chlorate, bromates, and perchlorates all made mostly electrochemically, um, oxidizing various chlorine-containing materials. Uh, one other important thing is, um, I'm not sure how much is made this way anymore. I think it's still made this way, although I could be wrong. They use, uh, and this is about the only really important uh, organic electrochemical process, is the electrolysis of a diponitrile, which is a precursor in the formation of nylon materials from a acrylonitrile. And um, you can see the reaction here. And uh, you can see it's a fairly complex reaction, and you get propion nitrile the monomer and some trimers and polymers. And the acrylonitrile is, um, the acrylonitrile in the system, you wouldn't, again, you would not expect the uh, type of yield that you get. And you don't get that unless you do it under industrial scale conditions. Oftentimes, this is one of those things just like in the Colby reaction where you don't get the proper reaction unless you really do it a scale up condition at the proper amount of reagents and so on. And the thing is that um, 
this is often done in a uh, non-aqueous solution, but you can use it in emulsions of the acrylonitrile. You just mix it up very, and you get these bubbles of acrylonitrile in water. And, um, and you get, in buffered solution, you get 90% selectivity for a diponitrile, which is pretty good. And uh, they require about minus two and a half volts to do a reaction, but the, with the IR losses and the ohmic drop losses, they need about minus 3.8 volts to do the reaction, which is not too bad. And uh, so they use a lot of electricity in that, and that's a, like I said, it's very selective, so that's, uh, that's one of the reasons they're using it. They probably wouldn't use it otherwise. It's used a lot of electricity, but the selectivity is such that they, uh, they get their uh, money out of it. Let's see. So I guess we're um, we're finished. We're not really. I don't think we have time to talk about the paper, but um, maybe we have a little bit of time. But just, just let's just say, you know, at the end. So I hope you have got something out of the class. I think we've we've covered a lot of ground. I know that we've gone through very quickly that book, and we've left stuff out, obviously. So. Um, but I think I've gotten enough, I think you probably should have learned enough to do a lot of, of your own initiative and own study to, to help you learn some things now. You got enough knowledge, I think, to get, to read that book and understand it. <laughs> Whereas before, I don't think you probably could read it and understand it. So, um, so uh, I hope you learned something and